Hello, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday with 3W. Wellness Wednesday is sponsored by 3W Medical for Women, a nonprofit medical clinic offering free of charge or low cost reproductive health services to women in the Seattle area, regardless of income or insurance status. 3W does not profit off of the reproductive health choices women make. The information shared in this podcast is the opinion of the speaker or speakers. Medical information is not intended as individual medical consultation, but for general education only. Always consult your own health professional for personalized advice regarding medical decisions. And if you're in the Seattle area, consider making an appointment to consult with us. I'm Helen Nguyen, CEO and co-founder of 3W Medical for Women and the host of today's podcast. Hi there, Wellness Wednesday with 3W listeners. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us today. For all of our faithful listeners from the very beginning, I just want to say a big, big thank you. Uh, You know, thanks for hanging in there. We kind of didn't know what we were doing in the beginning, but I think that we're in a really good groove now. And it's, it's thank you to the 3W team for making this happen. But, um, thanks for joining us again. Today, we're talking about a pretty tough topic. Um, it seems like, it seems like our podcast just keep getting tougher with the topics that we're choosing. But I think that also means that, um, we're hitting something that's really unique, that's really prevalent in, in our community. Um, and we're, I'm just really excited to continue to talk about these topics because we really just want to serve. We want to serve the community. And even if these topics make us uncomfortable, it needs to be talked about. It needs, there's education behind it and there are people hurting from it. So today's topic is the prevalence of women in their sexual addiction to pornography. And I have with me a, a wonderful uh, uh, young woman. Um, I can say that now, now that I'm in my 30s. Um, <laughs> her name is Rachel Kalaki, and she is going to share her story and her journey with addiction to pornography and the effects that it had on her life. We're gonna we're gonna walk through some stats that are pretty alarming. Um, this is not in any way to shame or judge or put anyone down if you're engaging in pornography right now that this is not that type of podcast is not that type of conversation this is Rachel sharing her story and her vulnerability and putting herself out there because uh Rachel and I were talking before this and it's such a shameful, silent kind of addiction, especially Mm -hmm. for women. And it's just, I just feel like it's time to open wide this, this door and talk about it really candidly. Um, Because with any type of addiction or type of engagement uh, like this, there are pros and cons to it. So I just wanted to highlight this because we've been observing more and more patients come through our doors with these types of questions, sharing with our medical providers, which I'm so grateful for. Thank you for doing that and trusting us with this. Um, But sharing with our medical providers, their engagement in pornography and how it is affecting women physically. It's not just a Mm -hmm. mental thing. Uh, It's a, it's a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. So, um, so here's Rachel. And I just, I'm just so um, grateful to be connected to her. So Rachel, I'm going to just get started. So for you, when did, when did it start for you? When did you get exposed to pornography? It was a pretty young age, I believe, correct? Yeah. So um, I had some unwanted experiences from my childhood that Mm -hmm. kind of already kind of piqued my curiosity and made me desire a sense of control when Mm -hmm. it came to sexuality. Um, and I think that's often the case too. I know with the women I work with, that's, that's a large, large percentage is, um, women seeking pornography as a way to kind of reconcile with some experiences that happened to them as children that they didn't want. Um, so I was first exposed to pornography at 13. Um, and it was actually written, it was erotica. So it was, um, which I think is important to define because a lot of women, 
actually find themselves uh, first addicted to written pornography mm-hmm. um, and then progressing into possibly watching. But I was first exposed at 13 and struggled heavily from ages 13 to about 19. So about five and a half wow. years total. So that was eighth grade to my first year of college. Wow. Basically. Wow. I mm-hmm. see that's something so eye opening for me. I didn't even consider uh, erotic literature as porn. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because a lot of people don't, but pornography Mm -hmm. by definition is the extraction and portrayal of a sexual act for the sake of entertainment and arousal. Right. When you think about that, uh, that can be written, that can be visual, that can be just an image. Um, that can be a video, you know, there can be multiple, it can be audio. There's audio Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Um, solely audio. So I think it comes in many different forms and we have to be honest about Mm -hmm. all the forms that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even consider that. It makes me think back of the things that I've read in my right, teen. Right. It's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, yeah. okay. All right. So, um, yeah. I, you know, to prepare for our, our conversation today, I, I just did some quick Google searches, uh, and I ran yes. across, uh, <laughs> Oh, Google. Um, and I ran yeah. across the American addiction center mm-hmm. and they had like a whole, I want to say like pages dedicated to women and their addiction to porn. And um, it it, it said 76% of females between the ages of 18 to 30 years old watch pornographic material. Yeah. Do you, you know, with the work that you do with women around our country, is that, is that true? Is that the kind of the age range that you're seeing? Yes, a, a high concentration of mm-hmm. our women are in that 18 to 30 age mm-hmm. range. I was actually telling somebody that earlier. That's a huge, um, a huge part of our work. Um, but I think, I mean, my youngest small group member is 17 and my oldest is wow. 71. Wow. Like we, we have women who are married. We have mm-hmm. women who are single. We have women who are teenagers. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously working with minors in this topic is a little bit different, but mm-hmm. we have women who are in their 60s and 70s and have seen the evolution of the pornography industry and have not been able to get help. And Mm -hmm. so I I think we have this wide age range, but we're seeing a massive, massive um, incoming from that 18 to 30 range for sure. So yeah, I agree with that. It's a, it's a staggering statistic. Yeah. It kind of like, you know, made me back up and go, whoa, that, that's a mm-hmm. big, that's a big number. And the, and, you know, we, we also have to consider these are just reported numbers, you know, they, right. they're not right. capturing people that are not comfortable sharing that kind of stuff. So it right. can be higher. It can, yeah. And it could mean, it could mean you watched it once. It could mean mm-hmm. you're an addict watching frequently. Um, mm-hmm. It can mean all sorts of things, but it also makes you wonder why mm-hmm people don't think this is a thing for women. When you see statistics mm-hmm. like that, you're like, how on earth? And I joke around that that at parties, like, you know, when you have the regular conversation, you're holding the beer and you're like, oh, what do you do for work? And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, I help women recover from porn addiction. What do you do? <laughs> you know, it's like it's people cool. either run away from me or, or like have a lot of questions, you know? Um, yeah. But more often than not, I get that like, oh, nice. I didn't know women struggled with that. Oh, you know, it's gosh. like a very, yeah. you know, there's a very limited understanding of, of Absolutely. Um, of that. So statistics like that, you wonder why, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't kind of on my radar. I always thought it was a guy's yeah. issue and it wasn't sure. on yeah. my radar or even my staff's radar until recently, until we are seeing yeah. the effects of it the uh, on our predominantly female population of women that we serve. Um, mm-hmm. It just kept coming up in conversation and um, you know, because we we give an hour of an appointment, we're not just treating the issue that they come in with. That sure. we, we're yeah. able to peel back and say, okay, what's what's the bigger issue here? Um, what's that the con- motivator? Yeah, mm-hmm. that contributes to now a physical um, disease or a, a physical issue. So for you, Rachel, y- you know, you said you it started at a very young age. Now, mm-hmm. how did it progress for you? You you started l- yeah. reading literature, but did it start now going on like Pornhub or something? Like where, yeah, where so did it go? I, actually, I never, I, and this is part of why I struggled to admit that I was addicted is mm-hmm. because I never accessed a porn site mm. ever. It was all on YouTube or other video streaming sites. Wow. I'm not kidding. Yeah. It, and the age restrictions on YouTube are so easy to bypass. Oh, yeah. 
Um, but it was all there, there's, there's deeply harmful and pornographic content on just Mm -hmm. regular old social Mm -hmm. media platforms. Mm -hmm. I have friends who would get, um, software that could block pornographic sites on their computers and their addictions would continue because, um, they could access it through Twitter and Mm -hmm. Facebook. So there's, I, I think the, um, the progression of, of my struggle looks like, first just literature that and I found it through Pinterest um Mm. it was fan fiction and that was how my first exposure happened and so I could easily access it through Pinterest and then it progressed into into videos Mm -hmm. and um I think that's that's typical that's what I've seen a lot of um in women that I work with is something about the written the literature Mm -hmm. allows us to uh, use our imagination, be creative, mm-hmm. you know, like all of those things that women love to do when we're thinking about relationships, especially, sure. you know, there's a certain investment that literature allows you to have. And so I think that's why it's very, very capturing of the female mind, um, mm-hmm. especially in a pornographic sense. But yes, I did progress to videos. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, again, accessed it without ever touching a porn site which is really horrifying, but that wow. that's what made me think, Oh, you know, I'm not actually struggling is because, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't on the regular sites. Yeah. When did you realize that it was a problem? I think, you know, it was gradual for sure. Um, I remember being a sophomore in high school and having this massive argument with a guy in my class on whether or not porn was ethical. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, had a moral argument with this guy and I remember being so angry and, and recognizing afterward, like, where, where's my anger coming from? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that I was, in a sense, directed towards myself. Um, and it took me a few years to kind of grasp that. I think when I really saw um, how detrimental it was is when I recognized that, like, lust doesn't have boundaries. It doesn't, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't respect the fact that somebody's your friend or your friend's boyfriend or somebody's father mm-hmm. or your sister, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't respect like boundaries. It doesn't Mm -hmm. respect, um, the relationships you're establishing. Mm -hmm. And so I really recognized it was a problem when first I wanted to stop and I couldn't, which is characteristic of addiction. And second, when I became very, very uncomfortable with the thoughts I was having and the people I was having them about, um, it was Mm -hmm. affecting, how I perceived men in particular, because, um, you know, my, my attractions are to the opposite sex. And so Mm -hmm. I, that was where my lust was primarily directed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I became so saddened by the way I was objectifying men, Mm -hmm. um, and the way I was perceiving my own sexuality. And that's when I really recognized, okay, this is a problem. I can't Mm -hmm. quit. And it's, it's to my detriment that I can't quit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And at what age did you realize that? Did you say sophomore year in high school or was I that- was about 17 when I really came into that knowledge. Okay. And I actually went out my senior year. One morning I just woke up because I was accessing through my computer and mm-hmm. then also through um, my smartphone. Mm-hmm. And I woke up one day my senior year and went out and just bought a flip phone for myself. <laughs> I was good like, I'm you. so sick of this. And that really helped. Yeah, yeah, that was good. It was like a good, um, good practical step for me. But yeah, I think the technology obviously gives us so much more exposure mm-hmm. and internet pornography is, is mm-hmm. pretty rampant. But um, yeah, I, because before that I was using, before I had my own computer, I was, I was homeschooled, right? I was a homeschooled mm. Catholic kid. So when I hear from parents, yeah, when I hear from parents like, oh, it would never be my kid. I homeschool my kids. I'm like, y'all. Let's let's have a real moment here. Yeah, <laughs> if if there is any sort of computer or phone, in, like smartphone, in your home, right? It's a risk. Yeah, it's a risk. And yeah. um, so I think, yeah. Before that, I was using like a family laptop that I yeah. shared with my siblings for homeschooling. Yeah, and then I got my own laptop. Um, and do people even call them laptops anymore? I'm they saying do. laptop and realizing I'm like, is that a thing? You know, I don't know. But, You're in your twenties. You tell me. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I was homeschooled, right? I don't yeah. know. Um, but I, yeah, so I was using a family laptop and then yeah. I um, got my own and got a smartphone at 16. You know, that was when the iPhone was really yeah. hitting. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, so I, I think we have to be honest about our technology use mm-hmm. too. That's, I'm mm-hmm. kind of bridging into a whole different rant, but I think that's, um, I was about 17 when yeah. I really came to grips and started to push back. That was yeah. when I really 
really started. Did people in your life know that you were no. struggling with this or no. did you ever try I, yeah. to bring it up with folks and they just didn't get it because there was this stereotype that you're a homeschool kid, so yeah. it doesn't affect you? <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't homeschooled at that point, but it was not, you know, I, I think this is the case for a lot of faith-based upbringings, right? Mm. It was very much like there was a lot of influence from purity culture mm -hmm. of I would go to youth conferences or retreats and mm -hmm. we would be separated. The guys would get the porn talk. The girls would get a modesty talk, wow. right? Mm -hmm. Or an emotional purity talk, right? And so I think there was there was this mindset to me of I'm struggling with a male struggle. Mm. Like I, there's no context for me um, to place this in, these experiences. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, the this struggle basically, or this attraction that I have to this thing that I, I really don't want in my life. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's having a negative effect on me. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I could really mm -hmm. say anything mm -hmm. and I didn't, um, nobody was starting that conversation. And yeah. so my, I mean, my parents spoke about it, but primarily as a male struggle because that's what they understood yeah. and, yeah. um, they did the best they could. And I have a really, you know, wonderful family and loving parents. And so they in mm -hmm. no way created, um, or intentionally created shame or anything around this, but mm -hmm. I did end up telling my best friend in high school when I was mm -hmm. a senior mm -hmm. and um, her response was extremely loving and oh, um, very merciful. And she had never really struggled with that herself, but mm -hmm. she just responded with such, yeah, just such compassion. And that really gave me courage to share in the future. Um, mm -hmm. I have too many women who come to me just so damaged from people's reactions when they mm -hmm. finally try to share. It can be incredibly shaming. And yeah. if they get rejected on that first share, it can be really damaging in the long run. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can just imagine that that's such a again, it's it's just it's being portrayed as such a male driven issue. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important that we're having this conversation right now. And so that kind of ties into the next next question I had was like, what are some misconceptions about women in pornography use? Like what what are some things mm -hmm. that we can break? Let's break these stereotypes right now. What what would you suggest first? Well, I think it comes first from a conception that women are not as sexual as men. Mm hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Which was a cultural thing that was, mm -hmm. that was just kind of, um, which number one, it leads us to treat men like animals, which I don't think is fair either. And that's, that's unhealthy on both ends. Right. Um, but I think whether just in culture at large or in certain church cultures, mm -hmm. the language became, you know, men are the sexual beings and women are the gatekeepers. Mm. Um, women that's a don't lot of pressure. <laughs> it's so much pressure, right? <laughs> Like, why did we do this? You I know. know. <laughs> what, what are we doing? Yeah. So I think, um, I think it just created, yeah. I mean, it came from this creation of um, women not experiencing sexual desire very mm -hmm. prominently, which mm -hmm. I don't think it's that we experience it less than men. It's that we experience it differently. Mm -hmm. we experience it differently. Mm -hmm. um, we are just as sexual as men mm -hmm. and we just experience it in a uniquely feminine way and, mm -hmm. you know, in a way that only women can. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of misconceptions about women's pornography use comes from that, um, mm -hmm. that, um, why would, why would women ever even seek this out <laughs> if they're not even sexual to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So how does pornography lead to issues with masturbation? Yeah. So, and it's interesting for me because I work obviously with, you know, um, dozens and, and dozens of women at this point, um, mm -hmm. where masturbation is actually the primary issue for them and not wow. even pornography consumption. Okay. Um, they're, they're addicted to self-pleasure. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes there are several different avenues that can lead there. Obviously pornography, um, lends itself to desiring arousal and desiring mm -hmm. completion, right. And mm -hmm. the release and, mm -hmm. Um, I never, I never had too much accompaniment of my addiction to pornography with masturbation. I, mm -hmm. that was not where my struggle was primarily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I have women who are solely addicted to that, mm -hmm. um, that I work with and mm -hmm. it can be sought out of stress and like a mm -hmm. desire to self regulate emotion or self regulate stress. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be just a desire for pleasure. It can be multiple things, but pornography typically, 
um, will escalate to the point of accompanying Mm -hmm. um, with masturbation. And, Mm -hmm. And it's just... It's because of the nature of the thing. Yeah. And and Rachel, for, for our listeners out there, you know, Rachel runs this amazing ministry, actually. Um, mm-hmm. and, and Rachel, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because then it can give folks a little bit more context of, you know what you're talking about, not just because you've yeah. gone through it yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. I should have started with that. But um, like, who is this lady? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who is how does she know all these yeah. things? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, can you yeah. can you just give us like a quick nutshell of like, how many people are you, how many women are you working with on a daily basis? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm sure it's helping you heal um, mm-hmm. as well yeah. as these women. But I, I just think it's a fantastic model. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So I run an organization called Magdala and it is focused on helping women um, and accompanying women in their journey to recover from pornography, masturbation, and other unwanted sexual addictive behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um so we run virtual small groups mm-hmm. and with a curriculum or a curriculum that um, we've developed. Mm-hmm. And so we're not a 12 step group. We're not like sex, um, sex addicts anonymous mm-hmm. um, or something like that. Um, we are kind of our own thing, which mm-hmm. is, which is nice. Um, but yeah, we're faith-based. So um, we're Catholic, but mm-hmm. um, I get, I get women from all different faith backgrounds, which has just been a joy. And mm-hmm. Yeah, so we run primarily our small groups, and we have over 30 in operation now. Um, we started last March, so March of 2021 um, is when I got, like, a little kick to the pants to go ahead and start it from somebody um, who, you know, is very trusted in the um, anti-porn kind of industry. And um, he was like, this is such a need, and mm-hmm. you have a story, and you have a passion for this, and you need to go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. And I was like okay. <laughs> and I, you know, went on Squarespace and designed a website and was like, I'll do a blog and podcast and start virtual small groups. And yeah. I had run, I had run an in-person recovery group at my university mm. when I was about a year or two into my own recovery mm-hmm. um, or into sobriety. And mm-hmm. so I felt like I was in a solid place and just the conversation was not happening for women. So mm-hmm. I started an in-person recovery group and ran that for a year. And then, um, went into full-time ministry work after getting my master's. And then, yeah, now, um, now I do this and it's a joy, but we have, I think last week we hit over 400 women reaching out for help. So that doesn't mean they're placed in a small group, but over 400, I I get probably seven to 10, sometimes a dozen reaching out a week. Um, I personally lead three virtual small groups. I'm obsessed with these women. Like it's, <laughs> it's like I, sometimes like I, my husband like waits for me to come out of like running a group because I'm just like yeeted, you know, I'm just like, let's go. Like, I just, I love, um, I love encountering women in a place where they feel wounded and they feel ashamed of themselves. And, um, yeah. I, I love seeing women band together to become healthy. That's mm. the joy of what I do. I think it's just women linking arms and being like, Hey, um, you're being lied to about yourself right now. You believe lies about yourself. I believe lies about myself. It's mm-hmm. a, if it's not true for you, it's not true for me. And we can mm-hmm. do this together. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's so beautiful. Women are so good at creating community. And yeah. so I love, I love the community that they're creating over there, but yeah. So it's wow. called Magdala. Um, yeah, we're, we're here for anybody who needs us, but you know, that's it's, so it's beautiful been, been a wild ride. <laughs> it's been a wild ride. Oh, you're just in the beginning. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, wow, that's, that's beautiful. And I'm so, I love the way you talk about it in the way that it's like, it's women supporting women. It's walking yep. alongside each other and partnering each other's well being, holistic care, right? It's, it's yep. exactly what 3W tries to do here. Um, you know, mm-hmm. on, on the medical side of things, but again, because we provide space and time to really dig into these issues that are so multi-layered and it affects us in so many different ways, um, yeah. we're complicated creatures, you yes. know, us women. <laughs> and you know what? It's a good thing. I'm sorry. But uh, well, you know what? Yes, I'm not sorry. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> how since since your your uh, organization, it's still in that startup phase. Where do you, where do you see it going? Um, you know, these women, how do you know when they've graduated quote unquote from their addiction? You know, do they (sighs) share that with you or is it a lifelong uh, Mm. struggle, you know, kind of like 
for alcoholics and those that are chemical dependency sure. kind of folks, it's it's a it's a lifelong thing. Do you do you yeah. see this addiction kind of just being one and done once they've realized mm-hmm. this and gone through the healing process like you have or or is this something lifelong? And I yeah. and I, yeah, I feel like I know the answer to that, but if you can just affirm it or confirm it. Sure, of course. I think it's um I think it's very individual. Okay. But I'm in, I'm in school to become certified in, um, in sex addiction therapy. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting seeing, cause I come obviously from primarily a ministry background. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful to be immersed in a background that's um, psychological. And I, I mean, I'm in school with a bunch of social workers and therapists and they are just lovely human beings. Aww. And I love learning from them. Um, I just like read all their posts cause we're in school online <laughs> and just like, Oh my gosh, there, it's a whole world that I'm just, I'm so excited to know more about. Yeah. Um, but in the psych world, you know, there's a, the, the ownership of addiction, like I, the identification and admitting, like mm-hmm. I am an addict, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's very like, you know, very AA of like, you know, hi, my name is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. You know, <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. And we don't, we actually don't take that approach. Um, yeah. And I definitely think there's a value to admitting mm-hmm. this is where I am mm-hmm. and this is going to be a sensitive place for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it, for the rest of my life. This is going to be, this is, this is going to have to be a place that I am vigilant. Um, and this is where I do think being faith-based helps us is I have a redemptive mindset going into my own story and going into my own work. And I think you can have that redemptive mindset, whether or not you come from a faith background is like, okay. are, is my, is my woundedness and my brokenness, um, something that I have to be afraid of for the rest of my life, or is it a sign of a new strength that mm-hmm. I can come in? Mm -hmm. Is it a sign of a place that I'm supposed to overcome and be especially gifted in, Mm -hmm. um, experience new victory and new life in? And for me, in my own journey, I had to, the the biggest battle wasn't overcoming addiction. It was overcoming shame. It was Mm -hmm. overcoming shame that just like absolutely crippled my identity as a woman. And I think a lot of therapists say that is that the, the biggest battle if you're dealing with a, a sexual addict in therapy, whether man mm-hmm. or woman, is not um, not the addiction; it's the shame. Mm-hmm. And I definitely believe that is that redemptive mindset helps um, you overcome this belief of like I am bad, I am dirty, mm-hmm. I need to be afraid of myself, mm-hmm. I need to be afraid of my sexuality. Mm-hmm. And um, so personally, like I, when I'm talking about myself for a while, I would say I'm in recovery still, mm-hmm. um, and I'm five years sober now, so mm-hmm. we're six. Okay. <laughs> should probably know my exact date, you know, <laughs> but even that, you know, I, I don't, um, I choose not to, to say that anymore that I'm in recovery. I say I am recovered mm. because I, um, I just truly believe that, um, yeah, healing is possible. And, and many people do kind of have on and off struggles for the rest of their lives. And I need to be prepared to fall into that again, you know, mm. I, and that's something that I'm vigilant about is like, what could, you know, what could possibly be back there? I yeah. need to be aware of those triggers, aware of the things that are sensitive for me, aware of those wounds that led me there. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I, I don't know if that makes much sense, but I just don't no, think we should no. identify with our flaws. Like we should right. allow them to be there, be present to them and non-judgmentally receive them, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. but, um, I definitely don't identify with it. And I think that's possible for all women. Mm-hmm. Um, it quite frankly, somebody was asking me earlier, cause I'm giving a talk tomorrow at a retreat and they were like, how do you, how do you do that? Like, how do you stay so like composed and professional when you're talking about this super embarrassing thing? And I just kind of, Hmm. When I'm talking about it now, it feels like a drop in the ocean of my whole life. It really does. Mm. And I think we can feel that way about Mm -hmm. our experiences of brokenness, our experiences of shame. Mm -hmm. Um, We can eventually look at them and say like, you know what? I've grown so much and come so far that that's just a drop in the ocean of who I am. Yeah, You know, Mm -hmm. it's a stroke on the canvas. It's Mm -hmm. there, but there's a whole beautiful picture here that I don't have to be afraid of. I can embrace. I can be happy about. And, you know, that's a part of it. See, Rachel, I think that's that's why some energy led us to each other because that is <laughs> that's so beautiful the way you just put it. You know, the you. one of our um we have 
three W. I'm going on. A, I'm going to go on a tangent. But three W has this like other logo where it's like a bunch of colors in the background mm. mixed together, and that's why I gravitated towards it because mm-hmm. of where three W started and why it started. You know, it came from my friend's experience with sexual assault. And from it came this beautiful organization. And I gravitated mm-hmm. towards this, this, this mix of colors because just like what you said, it's like you think it's like a ruined picture or something. You think it's, um, yeah. you think it's like a messy thing. But when you step back and take a look at it, it's something really beautiful. And there's, there's beauty in the messiness and the, the story and the journey that we all travel through um, yes. to become the person we're meant to be. And sometimes we just won't learn those lessons until we go through those really hard parts mm-hmm. and issues in our lives. Um, so thank you for um, affirming that and um, yeah. seeing the beauty in the mess. <laughs> Cause yeah, we're all absolutely. broken, right? We're all broken in oh. some ways or another. <laughs> oh gosh. I think that's one thing that I, I just, I love my job <laughs> because, um, yeah, I would love to be paid full time for my job, but I love my job. Yeah, I think yeah. that, you know, there's that, the startup life, you know? Yes. Um, but yeah. I think there's, yeah, there's something about working, um, in, I think you could probably say the same in reproductive health or sexuality, you know, mm-hmm. sexual issues. It's mm-hmm. like, this is, this is such a tender place for people. Mm-hmm. This is such a tender place for women, you know? Yeah. such a tender place. Yep. Um, and walking with people in their brokenness in this area, it has just humbled me so much. And mm. just seeing like, man, don't we all just have our crap? You know, <laughs> like, don't yes. we all? Like, yes. this is just yes. not, and looking, looking at other human beings that mm-hmm. perhaps could be labeled unjustly, you know, mm-hmm. in other circles, I've just been mm-hmm. like, oh man, that's my sister. <laughs> that's, I I see myself in her. Like you got your stuff. I got mine. Let's do this together. And I think it just working with sexual issues, just, it really, it really creates um, this, this new vision of accompaniment of like what it actually means to walk alongside a person. And I love that about it. And the importance of community and the importance Mm -hmm. of like uh, one of the new phrases that we like to say around here is we want to be a girlfriend in your medical care. <laughs> and yes. that's, that's, that's very much what you just said. It's like, how can I support you from another person that identifies very much with what you're going through and you're not alone, yeah. you're not alone. And it can be really scary and shameful. Um, but there yeah. is a light at the end of the tunnel and just yeah. keep yeah. going, keep going keep keep yeah. healing and keep reaching out to beautiful um, organizations like yours for support. So just mm-hmm. thank you for what you do, Rachel. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I all fun. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. My, um, I just had a, a quick meeting with a, a, a donor, a very generous donor yesterday. And they're like, you are always so busy. And I was like, oh, I love it. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's so much fun. I get to do this. I get to talk to folks like you. And I knew this was going to be a two-part podcast. So I, 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 I'm I, going to wrap this one up really quick. Uh, and we're, we're going to have Rachel mm-hmm. back because we can dive really deep into this. And there's a couple of yes. other questions and a couple of other things I want to peel back with Rachel. But for today, mm-hmm. I, I just... Thank you so much. Thank you for being vulnerable with us. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Thank you for, for being having me. awesome and beautiful and helping the women that you do. Um, Thank you. Uh, walk this through this really vulnerable time in their in their life. So thank you yeah. so much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah. All right, listeners, uh, tune in again for the second part about this uh, really tough topic to talk about. Um, it gets me choked up sometimes, but, um, thank you for listening. Thank you for being vulnerable with us and, um, till next time. For more information about 3W, please visit our website at 3wmedical.org. That's the number three, the letter W medical.org. From there, you can learn more information about the services we provide, book an appointment or make a donation. If you'd like to support our mission. You can also call our office at 206-588-0311. That's 206-588-0311. If you like this episode, 
please share it with others and consider subscribing on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, stay healthy and be well.